This is A Good Girl's Guide to Murder, Chapter 6. Pip took the scribbled shopping list out of her mom's hands. It says bread, not thread, she said. Glasses? No, her mom said, pulling a packaged loaf off the shelf. They make me look old. That's okay, you are old, Pip said, for which she received a cold whack on the arm with a bag of frozen peas. As she dramatically feigned her demise from a fatal pea wound, she caught sight of him watching her, laughing into the back of his hand. Ravi, she said, crossing the aisle over to him. Hi. Hi, he smiled, scratching the back of his head like she thought he might. He looked nice, dressed in a white t-shirt and jeans. I've never seen you here before. Here was one of Fairview's only grocery stores, pocket-sized and tucked in by the train station. Yeah, we usually shop out of town, he said. But milk emergency, he held up a half gallon of 2%. Well, if only you had your coffee black. I'll never cross to the dark side, he said, looking up as Pip's mom came over with her full basket. He smiled at her. Oh, mom, this is Ravi, Pip said. Ravi, my mom, Leanne. Nice to meet you, Ravi said, hugging the milk to his chest and stretching out his right hand. You too, Pip's mom said, shaking his offered palm. Actually, we've met before. I was the agent that sold your parents' house to them. Gosh, must have been 15 years ago. I remember you were about five at the time and always wore a Pikachu onesie with a tutu. Ravi's chuckled. Can you believe that trend never caught on? Yeah, well, Van Gogh's work was unappreciated in his own time as well, Pip said as they walked to the registers. Go ahead of us, Pip's mom said, gesturing to Ravi. Oh, really? Thanks. Ravi strode up to the cashier and gave the woman working there a small smile. He placed the milk down. Just that, please. Pip watched the woman's face as it creased, folding with recognition and disgust. The woman scanned the milk, staring at Ravi with cold, noxious eyes. Fortunate, really, that looks couldn't actually kill. Ravi was looking down at his feet like he hadn't noticed, but Pip knew he had. Something hot stirred in Pip's stomach, something like nausea at first, but it kept swelling and boiling until it reached her ears. 248, the lady spat. Ravi pulled out a $5 bill. But when he tried to give her the money, she shuddered and withdrew her hand sharply. The note fell in a slow glide to the floor, and Pip ignited. Hey, she said loudly, marching over to stand beside Ravi. Do you have a problem? Pip, don't, Ravi said quietly. Excuse me, Leslie, Pip read out from the cashier's name tag. I asked if you had a problem. Yeah, the woman said. I don't want him touching me. Why? Are you contagious or something? I'm going to call my manager. Yeah, you do that. I'll deliver my complaint in person. Ravi put the money on the counter, picked up his milk, and walked silently towards the exit. Ravi, Pip called, but he ignored her. Whoa. Pip's mom stepped forward now, hands up in surrender position as she came to stand between Pip and the reddening Leslie. Pip turned on her heels, sneakers screaming against the overpolished floors. Outside, she could see Ravi, 30 feet away, pacing quickly down the hill. Pip, who didn't run for anything, ran to catch him. Are you okay? She asked, stepping in front of him. No. He carried on around her, the milk carton sloshing at his side. Did I do something wrong? Ravi turned, dark eyes flashing. He said, look, I don't need some kid I hardly know fighting my battles for me. I'm not your problem, Pippa. Don't try to make me your problem. You're only going to make things worse. He kept walking, and Pip watched him go until he passed out of sight. She felt the rage retreat back into her gut, where it slowly simmered out. She was hollow when it left her. Pippa fits a movie, 8 16, 19. Capstone Project Log, Entry 8. Let it never be said that Pippa fitz is not an opportunistic interviewer. I was at Kara's house again today with Lauren and the guys. Kara's dad, Elliot, was rambling on about something when I remembered. He knew Sal pretty well, not just as his daughter's friend, but as a teacher. I've already gotten character assessments from Fasal's friends and brother, but I thought Kara's dad might have some further adult insights. Mr. Ward agreed to it. I didn't give him much choice. Transcript of interview with Elliot Ward. Pip. Okay, recording. So for how many years had you known Sal? Mr. Ward. Um, let's see. I started teaching at Fairview in 2011. I first taught Salil in his sophomore year for AP U.S. History and then his senior year for AP Gov. So... Almost three full years, I think. Yeah. Pip. Did Sal take all APs for history? Mr. Ward. Oh, not only that. Sal was hoping to study history at Yale. 
I don't know if you remember, but before I started teaching at Fairview, I was a history professor there. I switched jobs so I could be around to take care of Kara and Naomi's mom when she got sick. Pip. Oh, yeah. Mr. Ward. So actually, in the fall semester of that year, before everything happened, I spent a lot of time with Sal. I helped him with his essays and his application. When he got his interview for Yale, I helped him prepare for it. He was such a bright kid. Brilliant. He got accepted there, too. I was so proud of him. Pip. So Sal was really smart. Mr. Ward. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Very, very smart young man. It's such a tragedy what happened in the end. Such a waste of two young lives. Sal would have gone on to do great things. Pip. Did you have a class with Sal on that Monday after Andy disappeared? Mr. Ward. Oh, gosh. I think so, actually. Yes, because I remember talking to him after and asking if he was okay about everything. So, yes, I must have. Pip. And did you notice him acting strangely at all? Mr. Ward. Well, it depends on your definition of strange. The whole school was acting strangely that day. One of our students was missing, and it was all over the news. I suppose I remember him seeming quiet. Worried. Pip. Worried for Andy? Mr. Ward. Yes, possibly. Pip. And what about on Tuesday, the day he killed himself? Do you remember seeing him at school that morning at any point? Mr. Ward. I... No. I didn't because I had to call in sick that day. I had a bug, so I dropped the girls off in the morning and spent the day at home. I didn't know until the school called me in the afternoon about this whole Naomi Sal alibi thing and that the police had interviewed Naomi and her friends at school. So the last time I saw Sal would have been that Monday during class. Pip. And do you think Sal killed Andy? Mr. Ward. Sighs. I mean, I can understand how easy it is to convince yourself he didn't. He was such a lovely kid. But considering the evidence, I don't see how he couldn't have done it. As wrong as it feels, I guess I, he must have. There's no other explanation. Pip. And what about Andy? Did you teach her too? Mr. Ward. No. Well, um, yeah. She was in the same class as Sal sophomore year, so I had her then. But she didn't take anything with me after that, so I'm afraid I didn't really know her that well. Pip. Okay. Thanks. You can go back to peeling potatoes now. Ravi hadn't mentioned that Sal was going to Yale. There might be more he hasn't told me, but I'm not sure he'll ever speak to me again, not after what happened a couple of days ago. If Sal was so smart and Yale-bound, then why was the evidence that linked him to Andy's murder so obvious? So what if he didn't have an alibi for the time of Andy's disappearance? He must have been clever enough to get away with it. I'm sure of it. P.S. We all played Monopoly with Naomi tonight, and... Maybe I overreacted before. She's still on the persons of interest list, but a murderer? There's no way. She's just too nice. Even I have more of a killer instinct than Naomi. End of chapter six.